Good evening and welcome to Gallaudet University. To Gallaudet University and the PhD in Educational Neuroscience, Distinguished Lecture Series in Educational Neuroscience. My name is Bradley White. I'm a second year student in the Educational Neuroscience program. I want to extend a personal and warm welcome to the Gallaudet University students, faculty, and staff who are able to join us this evening and other univers area universities that are here with us in the room today, including Georgetown University. Also, I want to extend a warm welcome from everyone that is watching from home. This is our second lecture in this year's series entitled Educational Neuroscience Pioneers Revolutionizing the Study of Science and Learning in the Young Child. I am delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Karen Adolf. She is a professor in the Department of Psychology, the Center for Neuroscience at New York University. She received her bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence College and her master's and PhD from Emory University. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the American Psychological Society and the president of the International Society for Infant Studies. She is also the author of many scientific publications. She has received countless awards, including the James McKean Cattell Sabbatical Award, the APF Robert L. Fance Memorial Award, and the APA Boyd, Boyd McCantless Award, and many, many others. Dr. Adolph promotes data sharing and behavioral sciences through her databrary.org project. Dr. Adolph is here today because of her major contribution to pioneering science and educational neuroscience. Her leading discoveries include infant learning and development, especially in the area of motor skill acquisition. Her contributions include learning more about the effects of body growth exploratory activity, environmental and social supports, and culture on perceptual motor learning and development. Please help me welcome Dr. Adolph, and her presentation is entitled, Learning to Move and Moving to Learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> um, so this talk is about learning to move. Um, and learning to move is one of the most important tasks of infancy. So for us, understanding how babies learn to move is one of the most important tasks of developmental research. And I don't think that we can understand it if we focus on only one part of the problem. So you can't just focus on you know, the muscles or the limbs or any other part of the body. And you can't just focus on parts of the brain or even all of the brain or on the structure of the physical environment or on what parents do or don't do. You have to study all of it. You have to study a baby in a body with a brain in a physical environment that's filled with other people. I think we really have to study all of it, all at once. Babies learn to move in the context of development. So my talk is divided into three parts, embodied, embedded, and enculturated learning. By embodied, 
I mean that learning takes place in a particular body with a particular set of skills. By embedded, I mean that learning takes place in a particular physical environment that's filled with things, objects, and surfaces. And by enculturated, I mean that learning takes place in a social and cultural environment that's filled with other people. It's filled with caregivers who have particular kinds of child-rearing practices. Learning happens in development. Babies are learning to move at the same time that their bodies, their skills, and their physical and social environments are developing. So I'm going to start with the idea that learning is embodied. Children's bodies and skills are always changing. These photos show change in body growth from birth to 12 months of age. And these photos on the bottom are showing changes in babies' postural and locomotor skills over their first year. The point, <laughs> the point is that changes in infants' bodies and skills actually change the opportunities for learning. So first I want to focus on the transition from crawling to walking. So from when babies are moving around on all fours to when they get up and they're moving around upright. Um, <laughs> new walkers fall a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and some of the falls look pretty good. <laughs> um, but falling is not aversive enough to make them stop trying. So <laughs> clearly there's consequences for errors in balance that babies are still going to want. Now, most falls don't happen because of a change in the ground surface. Babies just have trouble keeping balance on two feet. <laughs> and in fact, the transition from crawling to walking, it raises a really big question. Why would, so the transition from crawling to walking raises a really big question. Why would a baby who can crawl give that up in order to walk? So why would a baby give up crawling so that they're gonna look like this? <laughs> why, how, how could, how could it be that a really good crawling infant would know that someday walking is going to really turn out to ultimately be the best way to get around. These are data from two groups of 12-month-old infants, experienced crawlers and novice walkers. Now, on average, the novice walkers, those are the babies in blue, they're falling twice as often as the experienced crawlers. So the novice walkers are falling like 32 times an hour, whereas the experienced crawlers are only falling 17 times an hour. So why would a baby give up crawling in order to walk when they're going to fall twice as frequently? Here's a possible answer. Even though new walking infants are terrible walkers, they're really terrible, immediately a novice walker gets more bang for the buck compared with an expert crawler. So novice walkers spend way more time in motion. Novice walkers take twice as many steps compared to crawlers. And novice walkers travel three times the distance of an experienced crawler. And now I'm showing you falls reconsidered relative to activity levels. So the time in motion before each fall, the accumulated number of steps until the baby falls, and the distance the baby travels until they fall. And you can see that walkers actually don't incur an increased cost. So the expert crawlers and the novice walkers look the same on all three of these graphs. So for example, walkers fall one time for every 69 steps, Crawlers fall one time for every 55 steps. So why not switch from crawling to walking if there's no increased cost and you get to go three times the distance? Here's additional data from a longitudinal study. Now, at each week of crawling, the babies get faster and faster. 
But now, look what happens when those same babies get up and begin to walk. They're faster from their very first week of walking compared with their last week of crawling. So as new walkers, truly horrible walkers, <laughs> they're going faster in their first week of walking than after they've been crawling for 21 weeks. Why walk? <laughs> well, one result of switching from crawling to an upright posture is that it actually changes infants' whole view of the world. The ability to crawl and then the ability to walk literally affects what babies can see. So I want to show you crawling infants' view of the world. The bottom panel is just showing you a view of a baby crawling. The top panel is showing you what the baby can see while he's crawling. And the crosshair is the point of gaze. Um, so that's where the baby's directing its attention, and then the whole screen is showing you what's in the baby's field of view. So <laughs> while babies are crawling, they're seeing the floor right in front of their hands. That's what they're seeing. Here's what a walking infant sees. So look at the top panel. That's what a walking infant can see while they're walking. And here's the results in a nutshell. These schematics are drawn to scale, and they show the average field of view for a crawler compared with a walker. While babies are crawling, they mostly see the floor. While they're walking, they can see the whole room. And why is that? It's because vision is embodied. While you're crawling, your head is pointing down. <laughs> and when a crawling infant tries to crank its head up as far as its neck can go, they can only see the bottom of the far wall. We know this because we put motion tracking markers on infants' heads. And then while a baby's upright, it can turn its head up to the ceiling or down to the floor. So what crawlers do, since they can't see, is they sit up. They can't see anything while they're crawling, so they sit up in order to see where they're going. So while they're crawling, all they're seeing is the floor. Then they sit up, and the whole room swoops into view. When they sit up, they see the same things that a walker can see. Now, sitting up solves the problem of trying to move with your head pointing at the floor, but it creates a new problem for visually exploring the environment. Because when babies sit up, it changes their body orientation. So let me show you what that looks like. When a baby sits up from crawling, they have to roll over their hip, and it turns their body 90 to 180 degrees away from the direction they were originally facing. <laughs> to measure changes in infants' body orientation, we determine the direction they were heading while they were crawling and then while we were, they were sitting, and we did it against the clock face. This polar plot shows the frequency of various changes in children's body orientation against a clock face. The length of the wedge from the center of the polar plot going out shows the relative frequency of turns at that angle. So here you can see that the transition from crawling to sitting is turning babies' bodies 90 degrees away from the direction they were originally facing. And that crazy change in orientation, when infants make that real-time transition between crawling and sitting, it makes locomotor exploration go in every direction. So this baby starts out crawling, heading to the northwest. She sits up. Now she's facing in a different direction. And then when she takes off crawling again, now she's headed in a completely different direction from where she was originally headed. And you can see that phenomenon really clearly in a polar plot. So 
when crawling, they start out facing in one direction, they sit up, and then after they're done sitting and go back to crawling, they're going in a completely different direction. So sitting up to look where they're going <laughs> causes the infants to adopt a really crazy, jaggedy pattern of exploration around their environment. Like vision, locomotor development also affects how babies play with objects. This graph is showing you babies that are all the same age. They're all 13-month-olds. Um, and some of them can crawl, and some of them can walk. They play the same amount with objects, and it's a lot. They're playing with objects for 30 to 40 minutes out of every hour. These are just like babies in their house just doing, being a baby. Um, but the quality of their object play is really different depending on whether the baby is a crawler or a walker. One thing that's different is how much babies carry objects. So these data are how much spontaneous carrying per hour in crawling versus walking infants at 13 months of age. And you can see, walkers carry objects a lot more than crawlers, but crawling babies also carry objects. Some of these guys are carrying objects 20 times an hour. A crawler's lugging an object around 20 times an hour. <laughs> and I want to show you, okay, I have to talk through this. <laughs> crawlers can carry objects. So they can carry objects by just holding it in their hand and crawling on top of it. Um, they can carry objects by holding it under one arm and scooching along. They carry objects by pushing them along the floor. They carry objects by bum shuffling, that's what that's called, and holding the object in their hand. And they can crawl carrying objects with the object in their mouth. <laughs> Sometimes babies use objects to initiate interactions with their mothers. Now, since both crawling and walking infants can carry objects, do they carry objects to share with their mothers? <laughs> Even though crawlers can carry objects, when they want to share it, they do it from a stationary position. So they sit there, and they hold up the object, and they wait for their mother to pay attention to them from across the room. They're in a stationary position, and then they offer the object. Walkers share objects by picking the thing up and carrying it over to their mother and putting the object in her face. That last one's like one of my all-time favorite clips because it's like this kid is going on a trek, you know, <laughs> through the apartment to carry an object so he could share it with his mother. All right, here's the data. Crawling infants share objects from a stationary position. That's the big blue bar. Walking infants also share from a stationary pos position. But in addition, they'll approach their mother with the object. So. Even though both crawling and walking infants can carry objects, when crawlers want to share with mom, they wait for their mother to respond to them from across the room. But if a walker wants to share, they take the object and move it over to their mother and then share it. So these developmental changes from crawling to walking affect how babies share objects with their mother. But does it matter to the mother? How do the moms respond? Well, moms do different things. One thing that's really popular is they just ignore the baby. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes they just affirm that the baby did something. Like they'll say yes or okay or thank you. It's kind of like a proof of life. Like your kid goes like, ah, and you just go like, yeah, you're t you talked. Mothers can use referential language. That's essentially nouns, adjectives. So this is actual real information about the object. That's the duck. Oh. Yeah, oh, orange ball. And they can use action directives. These are verbs. These are function words. These are things that you can do with the object. Oh. The blank. Oh. Okay, so 21 of the crawlers in this study never carried an object to their mother. They only shared from a stationary position. And when they held up that object and tried to share it with their mother, the moms ignored them or affirmed them. But they didn't really like say anything informative. All 24 of the walking infants also did stationary bids. Um, and there were no differences in how the moms responded. But all 24 of the walking infants also carried objects to their mothers. That's the red bars. And when the babies picked up an object and carried it over to their mother, the mother responded with action directives. So if you pick up an object and bring it to mom, mom tells you what you can do with that object. Now, five of the crawling infants did actually carry objects to their mother, and their moving bids are shown in the red bars. And when their data are compared with the walking babies, it looks the same. So just like mothers of walkers, mothers of crawlers are more likely to use action directives when their crawling infants approach them with an object. So it's not like, you know, the mother's sitting there and then thinks like, oh, hey, you've developed into a walker. Now I'll use verbs and tell you function words and things you can do with objects. Um, instead, it's the, it's the change to walking <laughs> um, offered something different to babies. It made it easier to carry objects around. So they're more likely to carry objects to their mother. And as a response to that, the mothers are more likely to use function words and tell babies what they can do with it. So the transition from crawling to walking has this whole developmental cascade that ends with a different kind of linguistic input in terms of how the mothers respond. So learning is embodied. What I mean is that changes in infants' bodies affect their opportunities for learning and for doing. And these changes in their bodies and their skills instigate a whole cascade of developmental events. Crawling and walking affect how much babies travel and what they see. It affects, makes them, um, bleh. infants are more likely to switch from crawling to walking because they can go more, they can see more, they can play more, and they can interact more. The real-time transitions between crawling and sitting shape how babies explore their environments, and this is because Infants' bodies and, um, and how their bodies can move um, are, are, are affecting the way that babies can see. So it's like James Gibson said, we look with our whole body, not just with our eyes. And the development of walking changes how infants interact with objects, how they interact with people, which in turn alters their caregiver's linguistic input. To them. Okay, now I want to talk about embedded learning. Learning takes place in a physical environment that's filled with objects and surfaces that affect possibilities for action. The physical environment is variable, it's always changing. And here's the really important point the physical environment actually develops because new parts of the world open up as your bodies and skills are changing, as you're getting bigger and better. 
And I want to tell you about our cliff studies. This is an adjustable drop-off apparatus. Um, it can have a very small drop-off, like a step, and a step affords locomotion, or it can have a really, really big drop-off, like a cliff, where locomotion is impossible. So this drop-off is like the famous visual cliff, only this isn't an illusory cliff, this is a real cliff. Um, experienced 12-month-old crawlers select their actions adaptively. So these babies will easily crawl down drop-offs that are within their ability, but they'll avoid a drop-off that's even slightly beyond their ability. I want to show you what happens in the same age babies who have just started to walk. <laughs> these babies will repeatedly walk over drop-offs that are beyond their ability. <laughs> Even a 90 centimeter drop off, that's a four foot drop off. <laughs> Babies will just walk right over the edge. <laughs> they actually have no clue about the limits of their abilities. And then six months later, after babies have a few months of walking experience, Again, they can select their actions adaptively. So these babies can perceive precisely within one centimeter of accuracy whether a drop-off is safe for walking. <laughs> Experienced 18-month-old walkers look like the experienced 12-month-old crawlers. They know precisely whether a drop-off is too high for them to walk down. So I want to show you some data. Um, the zero here is the largest drop-off that each baby could navigate. So the data are normalized to each infant's actual ability. The negative numbers are drop-offs that are smaller than the baby's threshold, so they are safe by definition. And the positive numbers are drop-offs that are larger than the baby's threshold, so these are the risky drop-offs. And this red curve is showing experienced 12-month-old crawlers. These are group data. <laughs> Look at those tiny little error bars. This is perfect. These babies are probability matching. They're actually attempting to crawl over a drop-off based on the conditional probability of success. And now in blue, I've added the novice walkers. These guys completely overestimate their abilities. They'll attempt a drop-off that's nine centimeters too large on 75% of the trials. They'll attempt to drop off that is 90 centimeters high on 50% of the trials. This group is the same age as the crawlers. The difference is they just had not learned to perceive the relations between the drop-off and their new locomotor posture. And now I've added in the 18-month-old experienced walkers in green, and they perceive equally well as the experienced crawlers. What this means is that infants are coordinating perception and action through experience with that perception action system. Crawling experience teaches infants to perceive what they can do while crawling, and walking experience teaches infants to perceive what they can do while walking. These longitudinal data, I, sorry, I have to talk through this one too. Um, they're gonna show really dramatically um, the transition from crawling to walking. So, this is a novice crawler, so a baby in the very first week of crawling. That's a fall. They have no idea how steep of a slope they can crawl down. By 10 weeks of crawling, infants make mistakes about half the time. So about half the time, they'll try a slope that's too steep, and half the time, they'll correctly um, recognize that the slope is too steep and slide down backward. By 20 weeks of crawling, 
infants have really fast, really efficient exploratory movements, and they can tell precisely within two degrees of accuracy whether a slope is safe or risky for curling. But then, when those same babies now stand up and face the same slope as a novice walker, they have no idea about the limits of their abilities. So they'll try to walk over really steep slopes over and over again, just as they did when they were first starting to crawl. And by 10 weeks of walking, again, their errors have dropped to 50%. They're not faster the second time around. They just have to have it all over again. These are, these are separate learning curves in development. There's no savings from crawling to walking. Learning is embedded in a physical environment. What are infants learning? They're learning to perceive and to exploit new possibilities for action. And part of that learning involves discovering and honing the right exploratory actions so that they can generate the information that they need for a perception. Learning from an earlier developing skill doesn't transfer to a later developing skill. Well, why should it? <laughs> New skills create new body environment relations. New skills mean new information gathering systems. The relations between body and environment are different for crawling and walking. There's different vantage points for looking at the ground. There's different sources of visual information. There's different um, haptic information from touching. Um, different. Uh, I'm giving you all these impossible words, proprioceptive information, <laughs> whatever, there's different forces, there's different parts of their body that are involved. Now I'm gonna to turn to the idea that learning is enculturated, that learning has to happen in a social environment, and it's an environment that's filled with caregivers who offer social information and who use different kinds of child-rearing practices. And I think enculturated learning happens at two different time scales. So real-time learning, real-time social influences affect how caregivers either support or constrain infants' perceptions and actions. The developmental time really depends on you know, parents' expectations and their child-rearing practices and how they structure their home environment. So I'm going to start with real-time social influences. Um, yeah. Babies aren't learning all on their own. They're absolutely not little scientists in a crib. <laughs> They're born into a social environment that's filled with other people. So this photo shows you a baby at the top of a really steep slope, and there's an experimenter right beside the baby who can you know, rescue it if it makes a mistake. Um, and there's a caregiver, a mother, at the bottom who's offering social information. So this isn't just a physical situation. It's also a social um, situation. The question is, how do babies weigh and integrate the perceptual information that they get from their own exploratory activities with the social information that's being offered by their mothers? Here's how we asked that. First, we found the steepest slope that each baby could walk down. So that's like their threshold slope, and that takes about 40 trials of babies walking down slopes. Then, we asked the moms to encourage and discourage their babies from walking down. And we did that on safe slopes that were shallower than their threshold, on risky slopes that were steeper than their threshold, and on truly ambiguous slopes, right at that threshold slope. So 40 trials to figure out what each baby's threshold slope was, then 24 additional trials where the mothers offered different kinds of social information. And here's data from 18-month-old experienced walkers. Babies ignored mother's social information on safe slopes and on risky slopes 
They're always walking down the safe slopes, even when their mom says, no, no, no. And they never walk down the risky slopes, even when their mom encourages them to go. But at the threshold slopes, where the perceptual information is truly uncertain, now the babies defer to their mother's social message. If the mom says walk, they're going to walk on 75% of the trials. If the mom says don't walk, they're only attempting it 25% of the trials. Um, this is a video of a typical infant at the threshold slope. Um, and the mom is going to encourage the baby. So the baby's going to try to walk. So this is the slope that is truly uncertain. And the mom is using her voice, her gestures, her language, her face, everything she can to get the baby to walk. Okay, this is the same baby at the same threshold slope, but the mom is discouraging. So now the baby is not going to try it. All right, so we figured if it's really true that infants defer to social information at the region of uncertainty, then if we change the region of uncertainty, babies should change where they use the social information. So we dressed the same 18-month-olds in tough-on-sold shoes so that we could change the region of uncertainty. These tough on felt shoes are really, really slippery. <laughs> so if that baby weren't wearing tough on felt shoes, that slope is really, really easy to walk. The tough on felt shoes changed um, highly skilled 18-month-old walking infants into really bad walkers. So we changed infants' level of walking skill, and therefore we moved the whole region of uncertainty to a shallower range of slopes. Here's the decisions for 18-month-olds while they're wearing the Teflon sole shoes. And now the x-axis is just the absolute degree of slope from 0 to 50. So the babies still knew that the really steep slopes were risky. But now, at these really, really shallow slopes, even at zero degrees, even at zero degrees, the infants are deferring to their mother's social information. They're more likely to walk when mom encourages them, says walk. They're more likely not to walk when their mothers discourage them. All right, so I want to push out from real time to talk about child rearing practices. Something as common in every day as a diaper can change the form of infants' walking movements. So we compared how babies walk in three conditions. While they were naked, while they were wearing a, like a thin disposable diaper, like a Pampers, and while they were wearing bulky old-fashioned cloth diapers with plastic pants. And we tested 13-month-old novice walkers and 19-month-old experienced walkers. And we tested them in a standard lab task. So infants walk over um, a pressure-sensitive carpet that records the timing and placement of each footstep. And it looks like that. And here's the short story, go naked. <laughs> so you can see the effects for yourself. These are the little trails of footprints from that baby actually walking left to right over the gate carpet. Um, 
The top figure, when the baby is walking naked, the steps are close together and in a straight line. And the two bottom figures show when the baby's walking in diapers, and the step width is farther apart, and the gait is poorly controlled. So um, here's some data. Step width is the side-to-side -side distance between the feet. Over development, step width gets narrower. Babies took the narrowest steps when they were walking naked. They took wider steps when they were wearing the diapers. Step length is the front-to-back distance between steps. Over development, steps get longer and longer. Infants took the longest steps. While they were naked and in disposables, they took shorter steps in the bulky cloth diapers. And the um, base angle is the angle between their feet. Over development, these angles get closer to 180 degrees. Um, infants showed the largest um, dynamic base angles when they were walking naked and smaller base angles wearing diapers. Now, for every measure, 19-month-olds walk better than 13-month-olds. Um, that means that the diapers are equally disruptive to walking at the time when babies are first learning to walk and when they're really skilled, pretty expert walkers. And in case you're looking at the you know, y-axis and thinking, ah, you know, like what's a few centimeters in step width or whatever between friends? <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the functional difference of wearing, say, a bulky cloth diaper on step width is seven and a half weeks of walking experience. That means that a baby wearing a cloth diaper walks as badly as that baby had done seven and a half weeks earlier when it was walking naked. The cost of wearing a pamper is five weeks. And in motor development, you know, a month or two months, that's like a lifetime in motor development. Diapers not only make babies walk badly, it makes it harder for them to walk at all. While they're wearing diapers, more babies misstepped and fell compared with when they're walking naked. So something as you know, seemingly mundane as diapers affects how babies can move and what their locomotor exploration looks like. I want to give you another example of toileting. All over Central Asia, caregivers use a special cradle called a Gavora cradle um, to toilet their babies. In the bottom of the cradle, there's a hole in the mattress, and you put the baby's bottom right over the hole so everything comes down through the hole. And then they wear external catheters. That's for a girl, that one's for a boy. And so the waste drains through the catheters through that hole in the mattress into a little bowl. And this is what it looks like. So they put the babies in the cradle. That's putting on the catheter. It's really fast. And they swaddle the baby's legs. Um, then they strap the legs down. They have to strap them because there's no sides on the cradle. Otherwise, the babies will fall out. Then they swaddle the arms. Then they strap their arms down. And then um, this must be the winter because they're covering the baby with a blanket. And then they'll cover the whole cradle. So, and these Gavor cradles are used from birth to like 24, 30 months of age until the babies literally outgrow the cradle. So they're swaddled from neck to toe and all they can move is their head. From videos of the babies just playing when they were outside of the cradle, we scored their highest demonstrated skill, whether they could sit with their arms down, sit independently, crawl on their belly, bum shuffle, crawl with their belly off the floor, cruise along furniture, stand independently, or walk independently.
Here's the percent of babies in each age group and their highest demonstrated skill. So at zero and four months, the babies couldn't do anything. But at eight months, 40% of these babies still hadn't demonstrated any skills at all. Only 20% of them could sit by themselves. Only 16% of them could crawl. To compare, by eight months, in our culture, nearly all babies can sit independently, and two-thirds of them are crawling. That, that whole bar would be green and red. By 12 months, only 50% of these babies were crawling, none were walking. In our culture, at 12 months, about half of babies can walk, and the rest are crawling. We didn't see walking until 16 months of age. So these babies are about four months off from the WHO standards or from our culture. And then by 20 months of age, nearly all the babies were walking. I have to say, they're off from our norms and from the WHO standards because guess what? Central Asia is not represented in the WHO standards or in our norms. That whole section of the globe is utterly missing from research on motor development. Cradle hours has a dose response effect on motor skill. That means that the more hours the baby spend in the cradle predicts what their highest motor skill is. And that's true even when you partial out the effects of test age. To measure how well they walked, we asked them to walk over a gridded mat. The hours in the cradle predicted how well they walk, controlling statistically for their test age. So these graphs are showing you that how fast they walk and the length of their steps are related to cradle hours. Babies who spend the least amount of time in the cradle walk faster and have longer steps. Okay, so, um, Constraining infants' movements can delay or impede motor development, but exercising infants' movements, facilitating their movements, can accelerate motor development. Um, and some cultures train their babies to sit and to walk, and the parents expect levels of skill really different from what would happen in our culture. So in some cultures, parents um, think about sitting and walking, not like, oh, you know, it's just like, like a little flower. One day my baby will sit and walk. They think about it the way we think about potty training and reading. Like, no baby's going to just, you know, sit on the potty and figure out how to go. No baby's going to just, you know, like Tarzan, pick up a book and figure out the symbol system and figure out how to read it. So they train their babies to sit. This is a typical five-month-old in Cameroon. It's a five-month-old. In our culture, five-month-olds don't even sit. This baby sits so well that the mom is utterly confident and walks out of the room while the baby is sitting on a high bench. So, I mean, anyone in here who has, like, a child, I know some of you do, like, how old were you, you know, how old was your child when you felt comfortable enough to walk out of the room and leave your child sitting on a high bench or a high counter. Um, you know, my daughter is 16. I'd probably leave her on a bench now. But when she was five months of age, <laughs> she couldn't sit, actually. But I wasn't confident, even when she was eight months and could sit, so that I could walk out of her room and leave her there. These parents are so confident because their babies are really that good. And these babies are sitting for extraordinary lengths of time. It's really hard to get a baby in our culture to sit for 28 seconds. These babies can sit for 28 minutes in a row. So there's huge cultural differences. This is Italy, Argentina, Korea, the US, K-12, 
Kenya, Cameroon, huge cultural differences in something like sitting skill. There's also a huge within group differences. And these differences come along with the different kinds of child rearing practices. So learning is enculturated. It's enculturated because caregivers provide their babies with real-time social information that affects their movements. And caregivers have different kinds of child rearing practices that affect infants' bodies and affect their environments. And caregivers structure the physical environment and they structure infants' activities. And in doing, they're facilitating or constraining the opportunities for learning. The real take home message from this presentation is that babies learn to move actually everything they're learning to do. They're doing it in a changing body that is situated in a changing environment, that has a changing layout, changing objects, and changing people who themselves have changing social interactions and expectations and child rearing practices. And I think that motor development is unique in developmental psychology because in this domain, we focus on embodied and embedded and enculturated learning. Um, and although there's few studies that are attacking the whole picture, it's totally feasible. And I think that research on motor development can lead the way. So I want to end with a few comments about sharing behavioral development. The Databury project is a data sharing project that's funded by NSF and by the NIH and by SRCD. And the idea is to help developmental scientists to get more out of their data by sharing and reusing research videos. So that's why I was pumping you guys about all your video, what you collect. Um, because um, if you're collecting videos, you can share them and other people can reuse them. The idea is that behavior is infinitely rich and complex. And video can capture much of that richness and complexity. So on video, you can see all of it, the game of tea, the social exchanges. Um, if I had the sound on, you would hear the language. You can see all the motor actions. You can see the context. To mine the richness and the complexity of behavior, we need tools, so we have invented them. Data View is a free, totally free, open source tool that allows researchers to score and explore and analyze their videos. It has a user guide has a support forum, has a best practices guide that will make your life easier. All right, the Databury itself, it's a library. It's an online library for housing raw research videos. And the aim is to promote open sharing and reuse of research videos among developmental scientists. This is important. Um, video is special. It's different from imaging data or thermodynamic data or flat file data. It's different because the video is the raw data. And in that sense, video can speak for itself. You can see what the researchers did and how the children responded. You don't need to know how the data were processed or what instrument collected the data because it's all there on the video. So there's no issues with data provenance. And that means that other researchers can reuse your videos, videos that were collected in a different researcher's lab, so that they can ask questions that are going beyond the scope of the original study, questions that maybe the original person had never even imagined. <laughs> on a 
honestly, typically, I code my videos with the sound off. If I didn't have collaborators who knew something about language, I wouldn't be here telling you about you know, action directives. I don't really actually even know what an action directive is. <laughs> but someone else can come in and do language analyses on my videos that I have been scoring for things like how many steps and how many falls. By sharing and reusing videos, we can increase transparency, we can speed progress. And the Databrary provides a video management system, and it will automatically um, transcode, can I say that, videos into preservable formats. So basically, Databrary organizes and stores your videos indefinitely. Um, here's what you would see if you go to Databrary. There's buttons for browsing data sets, for browsing people. Um, for looking at you know, key tags. Um, you can check out what your colleagues are up to. You can search for excerpts that you might want to show when you're teaching your developmental class. Um, this is um, a study that Mike Frank did that was about eye tracking. You can see what all the other stuff that Mike Frank is up to um, or any of the other researchers um, who are sharing and storing um, their videos in Databrary. So share, reuse, enjoy. <laughs> um, Thank you so much, wonderful presentation. We have some time for questions and answers. Yeah. And I also want to say, if you have a question, if you could please come up to this point in the stage here. And uh, we also have interpreters, or if you would like to speak your question, you can do that as well. But we all need to come up front so that we can see. So any questions, please come forward. We have a question here. Am I in the right place? X marks the spot. I enjoyed your presentation very much, uh, Dr. Adolph. Wonderful. At some point, I did wonder, you know, like, but what about, and then your next slide answered my question. So, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I am wondering, uh, when you were talking about young infants, the new crawlers versus the new walkers and expert crawlers or more experienced walkers and looking at the differences and that it doesn't transfer across. So what I, what I learned as a crawler does not transfer to walking. And thinking about like the Teflon shoes and the cloth diapers versus uh, pampers. And it, I, was, I, was, I was amazed. I didn't think about walking and crawling that much till today. <laughs> so my question is, with the younger toddlers, when they're learning these things, how quickly does their system, I think, that their informa information gathering mechanisms, how quickly do the children adapt? So for example, you gave them the Teflon shoes, how that impacted their immediate recognition of, oh, this is not you know, an appropriate degree of slope with these shoes, or did they have to fall a few times before that happened? Or uh, So that's one part. And then the other question is relative uh, dealing with the, the randomness of it. So I'm wondering if in diapers, uh, well, let's say they're already naked, <laughs> as they usually are, right? So then they put a diaper on. So are they, is it more awkward for them to put it on a diaper? And then how do they adjust to that? Okay, so, whoops. Um, yeah, so 
Okay, first of all, the Daper study was in New York City, and I don't know what you guys do in Washington, D.C., but more than half of the babies had never walked naked because like, we don't have anywhere that you would have a naked baby walk. The average number of minutes um, per week walking naked was some, something like 22 or something minutes. Like, they're, they're almost never walking naked. It's not like I'm running naked. All right, but this is related to your, your, your larger question, which was how, how long does it take to learn this stuff? And like, you know, did I have to experience a fall in order to figure out the Teflon cell truth? All right, so in developmental time, it takes months. It takes months for babies to figure out how to recalibrate. It's not like I'm a complete idiot, false alarm at 100%, and then months go by, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, perfect. It's like gradually, 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 day after day, week after week. It takes about 20 weeks of practice. Now, what does it mean to practice? I didn't show you these data, but the average toddler is taking something like 14,000 steps a day in a waking day. They're traveling the distance of something like 45 American football fields in a day. So multiply that out by 20 weeks before a baby has adult-like perception of the limits of its abilities. But once you get there, you're there. Like, I, you can wear heels, you can wear a tight skirt, you can, you know, like, deal with, like, a new little, whatever, this drop-off thing that I've never done before. And I can recalibrate instantly. And so can every healthy adult, and so can every healthy 18-month-old infant. You know, babies who have been walking, by six months of walking, they look, they look brilliant, they look like an adult. So, it's very much like language. Movement is creative, and it's generative. You don't want someone who has, and the other part of your question, like, do you have to fall in the Teflon sold shoes? No. They come in the lab, and they know what they can do, even when you test them in a situation they've never experienced before. And we know that because when we test babies longitudinally and then have control infants who are only tested at set intervals, they look the same. We know that because when we give babies special training, like, come on, if you walk down a slope hundreds of times, day after day, over weeks, surely you'll look better than a baby who just came in at the post-test, you know, 14 sessions later. They don't. It's just like, you know, you did it. <laughs> Every, that's what you can do. And it's just like language. You can say and understand sentences that you've never said or heard before. That's what you need with movement. You need something that's flexible, that's adaptive, and that can be like calibrated and figured out and, and produced understood on the spot for these local conditions. And it takes a long time. Um, I think it also takes a long time for other things that are really basic for human life, like language. But really good question, so thank you. Okay, um, excellent talk. Very, very interesting and thought-provoking. Um, so my, my question is, there seems to be an implication that enriching a child's infancy will improve their lives somehow. In other words, they perform better. So is this just speeding up development? Do these changes in the environment have long-term imp impacts? I mean, if you did it longitudinally for like, if you came back to these kids, Mm. eight years from now, would there be mm -hmm. a difference, number one, and number two, within each group that you noticed yourself, there was a lot of within-group variation mm. in, at, at each point in time. So even the regressions had a lot of residual variations on those regression yeah. lines. So do those differences predict long-term, you know, long-term differences, like for when the kid goes to school or when the kid begins to read? I mean, are there, are there any studies that look at the relationship of these early perceptual and motor mm -hmm. skills with um, later, later success as a student or as an adult? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question too. <laughs> and, um, and, and we had, had wondered about that. So um, to my knowledge, there's no good evidence of long-term effects, meaning year la years later. There's very good experimental and natural 
um, evidence for sort of short-term effects, like within weeks or months, right? But none over years by the time they get to school, no evidence of differences. Um, the Central Asian Gavora is really interesting because that's a case where movements are constrained, but there's no social deprivation. Those babies are beloved, they're the center of the family. The Gavora is typically the one piece of furniture in the home. They carry the, the handle so they can carry the baby around from place to place. Um, the babies are typically fed in the cradle. Um, you know, so they're in there and day at night, but, um, um, but if the baby cries or calls out, somebody is behaving contingently, like rocking the cradle or singing to the baby or minding the baby. Right? Um, part of the noise in that data is that it's just really, is the data collection is really, really noisy. So um, in our first study, all we were able to do was to find out how many hours the baby was cradled yesterday. And I think those data are probably robust, but it doesn't tell you how many accumulated hours from birth till today, right? And then the measures, so interesting, the measures of um, sort of their highest demonstrated motor skill, we did because the typical thing you would do is ask a parent retrospectively, how old was, you know, Lily when she could first walk all the way across the room, like from here to here without falling or stopping? And every other parent we had asked, you know, would say, well, you know, they, it was before, no, definitely she was doing it at Christmas. I remember she kept running into the, you know, they can date it. it the question makes sense. To the tragic mothers that we questioned, the question made no sense. It was like saying, when was the first day that Lily could read a sentence? And you go like, I don't know, she's in second grade, she's reading sentences now. But when was the first day that Lily could read a sentence? So they would say things like, I don't know when was the first day, when, what day do you want it to be? And we'd say like, we don't want it to be any day, we want it to be the day she first did it. And they're like, well, all right, three months. And we go like, no, your kids can't do anything at three months. Like, when was it, and, like the questions just made no sense. So we just videotaped them playing and said like, at least by now the baby can do whatever. For the gate things, like we couldn't bring a gate carpet into their homes because they only have electricity like three hours a day in Tajikistan. So we just did this, so the, the data collection is very noisy, which to me suggests that the relation between constraint and motor development is very strong. But I'll tell you what else, and this is what, <laughs> <laughs> what the people in Tajikistan said. Everybody in Central Asia walks and talks, you know, they do. They walk, they talk, they wage war just like we do. So, you know, what it suggests to me at the moment is that motor development is incredibly, incredibly plastic and all the other things that go along with it. Now that said, we had your same question. So um, happily NSF gave us additional grant dollars so we can check on these babies longitudinally so we'll know between age three and five whether there's some kind of you know relation between what their motor skills look like now and how long they were cradled as infants but they're all walking and running and you know we took this we started collecting these data now and the kinds of things you measure in three to five year olds are like kicking balls and throwing balls and whatever they're not they don't look great at it but they climb ladders, they ride horses, they, you know, walk over narrow bridges. Like, their lives are just really different. So, I think in some ways motor development is leading developmental science, but I think in other really important ways, we're lagging behind um, areas like language acquisition, which has always recognized that different cultures have different languages and different ways of speaking to their children and different kinds of input. And, Maybe we should look at the input, that probably matters. Motor development is just catching up in that regard. So, you know, like what I would say right now is if your kid in the US started walking at 16 months versus 10 months, you know, I wouldn't expect any difference in kindergarten and either one of them might play soccer or, you know, end up being Michael Jordan or whoever.
Thank you for an outstanding presentation. So appreciated. I noticed that there was a Procter & Gamble uh, <laughs> sign on one of the slides, and it made me wonder, is there any translational products that have come as a result of the research that you've done that might help companies come up with, for example, thinner diapers mm -hmm. that will facilitate the walking because maybe babies will feel like they're naked, something like that? I don't know if that's something that you can speak to. I'm just thinking about this being live stream. Parker and Gamble paid for the diaper study. Um, and of course, it went through grants and contracts at NYU. So everybody signed off that the data are going to be the data, whatever we find. And, you know, corporations have different goals. Maybe Parker and Gamble. <laughs> okay. Hmm. I mean, I think they would be happy if all of us were wearing diapers and maxi pads right now, you know, every one of you. Um, <laughs> but um, actually it was Procter & Gamble that put us in touch with the folk in, um, in Tajikistan and got, this, got that, that, that study off the ground. And, um, and Procter and & Gamble has been doing some really cool and exciting work um, in uh, Africa, especially um, helping um, girls to use feminine products so that they don't have to stay out of school because they, you know, are menstruating um, and helping girls um, to feel more empowered so that when they reach puberty, um, they don't um, suddenly have to change all their life goals and expectations. Um, for, for me, I'm not sure that I'm, I mean, my, my primary goals aren't to build products for, you know, Procter & Gamble's baby care branch to make even more money. My goals are more to understand how um, development works in typical and um, atypically developing children. Um, and I think that the findings um, actually have been very influential for clinical, pediatric clinical um, practitioners um, in understanding, um, in particular, understanding the enormity of experience that leads to, you know, typical, normal, healthy motor development. Um, <laughs> you know, we spoke a lot about how insurance companies are controlling um, healthcare in terms of deafness, but um, it also is true in terms of, uh, um, you know, motor developmental motor disabilities um, and. You know, like a typically developing baby takes more steps before breakfast than they're going to get in their insurance paid therapy over the course of a week. So, yeah, so that's more what I'm about is like trying to understand, and not just how much, but like what is the quality of those steps. And if we did have the funding to do it to help children with disabilities, what should their experiences look like? And I think the fact that exercise or constraint can change um, the timing and perhaps the course, um, the early course of motor development is, um, is encouragement and proof positive that therapy, which is essentially changing children's environments and experiences, can actually be beneficial. I do have a question, and I think we have time for one more. So I'll keep it brief. We talked a little bit about this earlier today, you and I did, uh, in our meeting. So I a little bit know your answer, but I'd love to have it um, broadcast here. The motivation to start walking from crawling. You said that one of the reasons um, a baby might choose to walk is because of the visual field and being able to see more in the room. Now I'm wondering about deaf babies or children of deaf adults who are growing up in a signing environment. They already know that they are required to see uh, more than is going on around the room. I'm just wondering if deaf babies or signing environment babies would be more motivated to start walking earlier than those who may be less visually motivated. I don't know. I think we should find out. I mean, you know, 
you guys have access to children um, who are deaf, and we could see whether an actual social motivation to be able to keep um, mother's face and hands in view is a motivation that makes them be upright more than prone. Um, it is also important to say that babies who can crawl can also stand and cruise. So cruising is when infants hold onto furniture and move sideways, holding the furniture for support. Or in Tajikistan, where there is no furniture, they walk holding onto the walls. Um, so it's like walk in quotes. They're not, they're not walking. They're using their arms for balance. Um, but they're upright. And babies who cannot walk independently but can crawl spend more time, this is hearing infants, they spend more time upright than they do prone. Crawling is a really yucky, difficult way to get around. And so most um, babies and children and adults won't do it unless there's some reason to do it. That said, you know, hearing infants, <laughs> they don't need to look at their parents' faces. And we've discovered in using our head mounted eye tracking um, um, technology that, that um, when babies are crawling or walking or <laughs> even sitting at a table, um, with their parents, they rarely look at their parents' faces. So um, even when the parents use language, so they can hear their parents, but that doesn't mean that they turn their head to see what their parents are doing or just look at their parents' face or their parents' hands. Something like 3% of the time are babies actually turning their head or lifting their head so that they can look at their parents. Um, might be really, really different in infants who understand that their parents but they have to look at their parents to get social information. So I think, I think if you should do it, we should do it, someone needs to do it. I think it's a really cool, great question. Thank you. Are there any other final questions? Thank you so much for the presentation. We really appreciate that you came to Gallaudet University. We really enjoyed learning more about the studies that you've done. And I think all of you received um, an evaluation paper a form, and we would really appreciate if you would take a few moments to help us with these lecture series. So please fill out that evaluation form. And immediately following this lecture, there is a reception at SLCC Atrium. I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's not at the SLCC Atrium. We're actually going to be meeting at the Kellogg Bistro, um, the second floor break lounge. So over at the hotel, the second floor lounge area. Everyone is welcome to join us there. Thank you, thank you very much.